Good morning, everyone. So I'd like to really frame today's discussion. Uh, so several themes here are from the title, Financing the Frontier, Capital Continuum. So I just want to frame that discussion. And um, we have a slide that kind of speaks to that, and it's really a backdrop. I won't get into the detail. Just trying to look at uh, what we are trying to discuss today, if we can frame that discussion. So two big themes, one, underfunded sectors of the real economy in Africa, whether you're talking about uh, women-owned, women-led enterprises, whether you're talking about uh, energy, renewable energy, uh, energy access, whether you're talking about uh, climate positive projects, uh, whether you talk about SMEs, and uh, I mean, there's some data there on SMEs, it's broader than uh, the African continent, but really just showing how SMEs really power economies, and uh, won't get into the detail of that, I'm sure my speakers will do so. So that's one point, that's one kind of side of the framing of the discussion. The other side is looking at different uh, enterprises across the capital continuum, from small and growing businesses to SMEs, to, sorry, to MSMEs, to more mature SMEs, and even to large, you know, well-established financial institutions that, cap, uh, that tap the capital markets for wholesale funding, for wholesale capital. So we might as well just jump right into it. And uh, I want to start off with Wairimo, who actually represents the, you know, the, the farthest end of the spectrum, if I can call it that, the small and growing uh, businesses. And so, Wairimo, do tell us more about your work at Persistent, uh, working with uh, early stage enterprises or ventures. Uh, what are the challenges? What solutions do you offer? So if you could just you know, paint the picture for us this morning. Thank you very much. Uh, Wairimo Karanja, partner at Persistent. I think I'd like to start by framing that. Um, so we work in the climate sector. And I consider the climate um, action sector, climate impact, actually a, a frontier sector in the fact that it's underfunded when you look at the numbers, when you look at the fact that as African countries, we need 300 billion a year by 2030 to fund our NDCs, but we only get 30 billion a year. So we need to increase capital flows by tenfold into the sector. Um, we've been trying to do that alongside other players over the past 12 years. So we've been exist in existence for 12 years. Um, we invest in the early stage of climate action. So that is the seed stage, the pre-seed stage of venture companies. Um, we've invested in commercial and industrial solar, in um, solar home solutions, in electric mobility, in energy efficiency, productive use of agriculture. And we are now um, launching a fund that's going to be a $70 million fund that we expect uh, to hopefully have first close in Q1 of next year with FST Africa as our anchor, where we continue with that kind of work. In terms of the challenges that we see in the sector, the, the first challenge, and we discussed this at the uh, last L FSD conference, is really a loop in terms of access to finance. Early stage companies in Africa just don't have enough access to financing. And that is because of various uh, factors, including the macroeconomic factors, including the fact that um, when a company goes to a funder, it's always the same question of, um, you know, we need experienced um, applicants, but then how do applicants get experience? Um, so those challenges in early stage financing are what we try to seek by actually investing that patient capital and brave capital in um, early stage companies. The next challenge is um, human capital, skills. Not that there are no skills in Africa, there, are, there is so much human capital, uh, but companies, especially young companies, if your pre-revenue or if your revenues are below a million a year in dollars, how can you afford a chief financial officer who will get you to the path to a Series A, Series B, Series C? How can you afford an ESG manager who can, or an ESG consultant who can bring all your governance up to speed? So we try to bridge that gap by providing venture building, which is 
more than technical assistance, if I can call it that, in the sense that we take our venture builders who are financial professionals, ESG professionals, to go and be seconded to companies and provide in-depth support for the companies. So that's, that's how I see as challenges on the continent and how we bridge them. I can talk on and on, but I will leave it there and also hear from other funders in the continuum. Thank you, thank you, Irimo. Um, and thanks for telling us a bit more about what you do with your brave capital uh, and I, I mean on the early stage uh, end of the spectrum. And maybe just moving on down the continuum uh, to Tokunbo. Um, I think Alithia Capital distinguishes itself as a fund manager of one of the largest gender lens investing um, funds on the continent. So keen to hear more about um, your, your focus, what your focus has been, you know, uh, lending to these uh, or funding these underfunded sectors. Uh, I mean, tell us more what the challenges that you see. Maybe they may be different, of course, from the small and growing businesses or the more mature um, SMEs in the spaces that you work. Yes, thank you. And good morning, everybody. And uh, I think we'll be inviting everyone on stage since we um, are just a handful, so we can just have a round table <laughs> and maybe actually get to all the solutions we need. Uh, quicker. So yes, indeed, Alethea Capital is the uh, fund manager of the first and largest uh, gender lens uh, fund on the continent. Um, but uh, really prior to that, um, Alethea Capital came onto the scene uh, nearly 20 years ago, seeking to invest not just for financial returns, but also primarily to ensure that we have impact and we can drive for inclusivity. Um, and um, help to build inclusive um, economies, so shared prosperity. So our journey really started where we began to address the financing gap um, for financial inclusion and how we could make it possible for ordinary folk to get access to financial services um, through microfinance. And then from there, we saw that if we're going to have the spread across uh, Nigeria, we need to look at technology. So we were one of the, again, first um, investors in fintech to leverage technology as a means for driving for that access to affordable financial services. And from there, went on to energy services, energy efficiencies, and again, looking at clean cooking stoves, addressing the issue of health, um, in terms of uh, reducing the death from indoor air pollution when uh, mothers cook um, with wood fire, they have babies on their backs, and addressing that health, which again is the largest, one of the largest um, cost drains in a family. If you're not well, you, then you, 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 you can't actually um, um, engage in productive activity. So again, looking at the essential services, looking at that inclusivity. And so coming to the question you ask around the, the gender lens and um, with the gender fund, again, it was thinking, if we can't have inc an inclusive continent where all um, entrepreneurs on the continent had an equal access to this funding, which is already um, scarce, and we're not including women in, in, in that equation, then we're missing on the chance to engage a full football team. I always say Africa can't reach its full potential if you only have half of your football team playing. So that's where the idea that we need to drive for those dividends of diversity by having inclus an inclusive economy that engages women full participation from being founders to being um, on boards to be in the productive um, value chain. Because at the moment, still, less than 5% of funding goes to women. So that was seen as an innovative uh, fund uh, 10 years ago. And I'm glad to say today that we're seeing the mainstreaming of that idea of being intentional and proactive about gender lens investing. So, but if I look a across what we've done to date over the last um, two decades, when we were thinking about how we can work with our, our companies more intentionally and amplify both the financial and the impact returns, 
what we saw is that we needed to bring a nexus of gender inclusivity, intentionality around investing in green energy for energy efficiency, intentionality around investing in digital transformation to ensure that broader access to services and also ensure that these SMEs can have broader reach. So now what, what we're looking at is at the intersection for investing um, in, in SMEs to be intentional for the dividends of diversity, for the energy efficiency and digital transformation. But if I take a, an arch over everything, even when you provide that funding, when we come to the challenges of SMEs, there's some things that are just difficult to shift. Macro instability. Um, if you're an investor on the continent, um, this past year has been a challenge for everybody. We've seen some significant currency depreciation that we haven't seen at least in the last 30 years. And that has affected how these small and growing businesses have been able to buy their inputs. Um, if they're manufacturing, our agricultural manufacturing processing companies have suffered from that. And so that intentionality, again, to say, how can we address that for companies? How can we enable them to not be so dependent on local currency? Is an area where we've been working with our companies and where we invest to help to broaden that um, revenue um, source beyond local um, currency. Regulation is an issue. In financial services, the flip-flop of regulation has been dire across the continent. And so we need to see some action that comes from the top with respect to stability in regulation and stability in regulation that can help us work with innovative companies that are innovating, whether it's in fintech, AI, what have you, such that regulators that don't typically understand these areas can be abreast and therefore ensure that we have that stability. And then the last thing that I'll touch upon is very key, because when we invest, we, we, talk, we say we're, we're bringing finance, yes, we're bringing intentionality around ESG, but we're also bringing access to talent, like Kwarimu um, talked about. We're bringing access to a broader network. We're bringing governance. That is a very key issue that I see in businesses. So we can give businesses finance, but we have to be intentional about ensuring that that governance is really providing a hedge around the investment and enabling that talented management to actually thrive at what they do. So I'll stop there for now and um, add Thank more you. later. Yes, great. Thank, thanks so much. Um, and I think for most of the panelists here, they will be speaking from the platforms that they have, the investment platforms they have across the continent. So it's a very Pan-African view that they are sharing with us today. Um, just to turn to Chinua on a specific solution or solution, suit of solutions that InfraCredit Nigeria uh, offers in that particular market. Um, and really, uh, I mean, do tell us more some of the challenges that, you're, that you seek to, you know, resolve in the solutions that you provide, if you could uh, describe that in a bit more detail, and we'll delve a bit deeper. Well, thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here, and it's also um, a privilege to sit with the with, with, uh, esteemed audience here, too. Um, thank you. Um, I've, you know, the earlier speakers have really spoken around um, what I would say is the evolving discussion around inclusive growth. Um, and looking at the work that Alithia Capital has done and also um, Wanjiru's fund, um, I'll just take a step back to talk briefly about InfraCredit. We were set up to essentially de-risk infrastructure um, by providing long-term guarantees in local currency in order to mobilize private capital from domestic institutional investors like our pensions and insurance to lend to infrastructure projects. Um, thereby deepening access to finance, but more importantly, mobilizing through the capital markets. Um, and over the past seven years, we've been able to demonstrate a couple of firsts in terms of demonstrating that, you know, 
companies, private companies can access long-term finance um, to build infrastructure that our domestic pension funds can actually lend in local currency in tenors of 10, 15, and up to 20 years to support companies to build um, you know, transportation network, um, telecoms, um, energy access. Um, and when we look at this across the continent, um, you know, it's estimated that our sovereign wealth fund pensions, insurance, hold an estimated about $2.5 trillion in assets under management. Um, how do we mobilize these domestic resources for development? Um, and then when we talk about infrastructure as an asset class, and we qualify that by what is inclusive infrastructure, because it's one thing to define infra from a broad lens, it's another to look at it within the context of the development of the continent, and then ask, how do we ensure inclusion? And then you look at the nature of your economy. Um, if you take Nigeria, for example, um, about 48% of our GDP is, um, you know, uh, SMEs contribute, MSMEs contribute to about 48% of our GDP, um, roughly around 98% um, of, um, of um, businesses as well, uh, and also you could see the number of jobs that they also create is quite significant compared to the broader economy. So when you look at these statistics and then you ask yourself, infrastructure for inclusive growth has to also cater for these um, players in the economy, but then you have to now redefine what infra means for the SME. And when we layer climate smart technologies, then you have to have a different lens through which you look at that type of asset class. And um, working with FSD Africa has been quite helpful for institutions like ourselves. Obviously, our mandate has an original thesis, but as you evolve and try to create new markets, you need partners that can help you to navigate those um, new, new frontiers. And we worked very well in developing some unique facilities, um, technical assistance funding that helped um, us to begin to assess first of all, the quality of the type of projects in these markets to get the data to better understand how to solve the problem. Um, and I think that's very important because first you need to understand the problem and then you can design the solutions and not the solution first and figure out the problem later. And that really helped us because we were able to assess a broad spectrum of um, climate smart technologies from distributed renewable energy companies um, that are providing energy access to and mobility businesses as well. And, you know, more insights as to how do you enable inclusive access. And on the back of that, you know, we worked on a facility called the Risk Sharing Backstop Facility, because even institutions like us have a perception of risk for markets that don't have that track record. You know, the challenge is the performance data that is missing with these emerging, you know, players. Even though, you know, um, players, uh, investors like, like um, Tokumba will tell you that the default rate is probably very low um, and it's a very resilient market, but we need sort of the data to help. And, um, you know, developing the risk sharing backstop facility is meant to provide some form of backstop um, risk sharing for entities like ourselves to enhance our capacity to now support these smaller perceived higher risk players in the market, but enable them to grow to scale. And so when you look at the market, the addressable market, um, and you look at, yes, they look like fringe players today, but the ability to deploy business models that are scalable because they have what is infrastructure for them. And they're very good examples are, you pick up um, immobility, um, two wheel, three wheelers. We know that um, India, for example, is a two, three wheel economy. Um, so is Africa in terms of when you look at the transition for immobility is largely going to be two, three wheels first before we see four wheels. Um, and the ability to provide asset financing that can help to address some of the constraints, particularly in the, in the charging you know, stations, but also in terms of the actual assets themselves, could fast track the, uh, the, the capacity of these markets to grow to scale because it's serving a huge market. So when you take these markets, DRE, Distributed Renewable Energy, um, we have one of the highest deficit, energy deficits in the world. In Nigeria, we um, have 22 million um, generators. So, uh, and that contributes about 25 gigawatts. And, and the, gig, the grid itself generates five gigawatts. So it gives you a sense of 
what the opportunity sits like, but also a lot of the energy, the gen set displacement will be done by distributed renewable energy, given the competitive advantage of that technology. And so how do you support such business models to be able to serve the customers by providing as a service, as opposed to upfront cost and reducing that? So again, financing solutions can address that market. So when we look at the infra for diary, infra for immobility, um, productive use equipment, lease to own, you know, for climate smart technologies, there's a huge opportunity to, to really support sustained growth, leveraging ultimately capital markets, because that's part of what our mandate is. But so we see a very, you know, um, very, a very collaborative um, um, opportunity across the continuum, right? And then across the capital stack as well, from the early stage equity to, to how senior debt comes in, to the risking mechanism, to really support what is really the, what will be the core of the economy. So I believe that whilst we have the mainstream definition for what infra means, but as we begin to look at what inclusive infrastructure means for gender, for, um, for SMEs and for inclusive growth, we could really tap into what is predictable, you know, inclusive growth for Africa. Mm. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, sir. If I may just make a point that when we look at our SMEs, the largest cost bucket is the energy. And that's why that intentionality around investing to, for energy efficiency is so key. Yeah. So it's across all the, 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 the spectrum. Thanks, thanks for emphasizing that. I think it's a really important point and thanks for sharing uh, those insights, uh, Chinwa. But I think moving now further to the further end really of the <laughs> capital continuum, and I remember, um, so I have a uh, regulatory background. I remember when you know large companies are coming to the market to raise capital, uh, to list. I mean, there are these requirements around track record and many other things that some of the smaller companies, of course, do, are challenged to, 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 to meet. And so, I mean, Olamipo really speaks to that kind of end of the segment and uh, keen to hear from you about uh, what the Africa Local Currency Bond uh, Fund uh, I mean, how it supports capital raising across uh, African markets. And I mean, what are investors like yourself looking at at that end of the spectrum? Uh, if you could share some of your, your insights on that. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much for having me on the panel. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I work with the Africa Local Currency Bond Fund, which is managed by Signum Capital. And what we do is essentially what the name says. Um, our key mandate is to promote the development of local capital markets. We do that either by acting as anchor investors to the transactions or just participating in transactions to ensure that the um, outcome of the issuance is successful. So we would typically invest alongside other local institutional investors like pension funds, um, insurance companies, local banks. We also have a technical assistance fund that um, is directed at covering some of the costs associated to coming to market because we realize that that could potentially be a barrier to um, issuances. Um, so for us, when we think about our investments as a whole, we think about our additionality and what role we can play. And you know that's even more important when you think about larger corporates that arguably have um, access to a wider pool of, of capital. Um, so we would typically think about it in you know three different ways. So firstly, um, what would be our additionality to the issuer? And is there a way where we can structure something where the ultimate beneficiaries are low-income households and SMEs? So um, if you're lending to a big financial institution, for example, would the use of proceeds be targeted more at SMEs um, to sort of drive that inclusive growth, which uh, many of the panelists on this um, panel have talked about? Um, we would also think about it in context of market development and um, what we are doing to sort of push the innovation in the market. So when I look at our portfolio and a number of the um, larger institutions that we've supported, um, there's always some sort of market innovation um, element to it. So, you know, we've supported many first green bond issuances in, in some countries. So the most recent one would be Tanzania, where we invested in um, CRDB. That was the first green bond issued in Tanzania. Um, we've also supported the first green bond issued in Zambia, um, which was to finance a renewable energy project. Um, so essentially is what is our participation doing to drive market innovation? 
Um, and I'd say the third thing is really how do we improve um, the overall um, transaction to sort of what we consider um, international standards. So part of our process is um, conducting a very extensive review of the transaction documents. You know, we have the TA funding that um, goes towards legal cost where you are working hand in hand with issuers to improve, improve the overall transaction documents. Um, and that in itself encourages even more participation from, from the local investors because there's a sense of, okay, you know, this transaction has been vetted um, and we are comfortable to go in alongside um, an international investor. So that's typically how, how we would think about things. Okay, thank you. I think uh, there's a lot that's been said about inclusive growth, and I think uh, from all the panelists we hear about solutions that they have, uh, I mean, they're thinking about it very intentionally and building it out in terms of their investment decisions and just how they um, implement various solutions, whether it's de-risking solutions or you know just investment uh, strategies. But I think the, the big issue is about, I mean, much as we're talking about financing the frontier and uh, the capital continuum, I mean, what does that mean exactly? Like, in terms of what, how does that translate into actual impact? And I think that's really where I'd like to go to with, uh, uh, I think, the next uh, round. And really starting with you, Wairimo, um, I mean, what would you say has been the most effective solution? From the work that you've done over several years, I mean, what have you seen as being most impactful? What can you say has been, yeah, I mean, what's moving the needle and what more needs to be done? Thank you very much. And I am on a panel with Giant, so I'm very fortunate to be here. Um, I would say the most impactful solution we have had as persistent is really in our venture building and the venture building model. And we see that also reflected in the models that have been coming up in early stage financing because there is a lot that is in venture building, right? So for example, when we, when we started venture building, our first major offering was actually in, um, in governance in capacity building in governance, be it whether a company even calls for board meetings or has a board or takes board minutes, um, or whether they take compliance seriously, not that they don't want to comply, but that they are, they just, they're just busy building the company and they don't have time or don't think that they have time to put policies in, in place and ESG is really big. The other offering that um, has really worked well is in um, CFO services, Chief Financial Officer services, because again, financial governance um, and compliance and um, records is really important. And that also aspect of, um, of CFO services also includes fundraising support and has worked very well in leveraging our relationships across the continuum to mobilize um, private capital. So if we invest in early stage um, series A, uh, pre-series A all the way down to pre-seed stage, then there's someone else who's going to come and we invest in equity. Then there are other investors, um, VC firms that are investing from say pre-series A, series A, series B, then we've got debt, then we've got guarantees and that works across the continuum. So um, Mary had asked if I could share some success stories. I think the, the first big success as a firm that we've had is just in the amount of impact we've had in our company. So, you know, over 1.4 million tons of CO2 that has been avoided by our portfolio, we've been able to leverage um, and catalyze multi-million dollars in financing from just investing 23 million across 12 years right um, and also in the jobs created um, including um, on a 2x level the fact that um, in terms of gender impact because we put those policies in place over 80 percent of our portfolio is fully 2x compliant which is really great and then the rest are on their way um, and then from an individual company level um, I wanted to highlight three companies. The first one is called Altec. It's in the DRC. 
Um, and we, they started in 2013, um, two Congolese nationals who were refugees in a refugee camp in Tanzania because of the conflict. And they decided to go back home and um, use their savings to just start a small solar home solutions shop uh, as SHS was starting up. And they built up the company. Um, we invested in 2016, we got other co, 2018 sorry, also got other co-investors to come in. And now they've, um, those two co-investors have created over 100 jobs, of which um, close to 50% are female. They have, um, they have distributed 300,000 solar home solution kits. They have um, gone into electric mobility as well because, you know, electric mobility, two wheelers is big in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. They have raised over 50 million in financing in both equity and debt. And in 2013, they were the fourth fastest growing company in Africa, according to the Financial Times. And this started as a small company in the DRC. And it's probably one of the reasons I joined Persistent. I heard their story and I was said, okay, <laughs> I, I'm ready I'm now. Um, the, the second company is called Candy Solar in South Africa. Again, we started venture building them. And this is a, it was a bittersweet success story because our venture builders that were working in Candy, two of them then actually moved um, to Candy, which was a great success story of venture building. But they, you know, just closed their Series C round, um, 38 million, led by Norfund, uh, Stoa, and Qden uh, International, which is actually our investor in Persistence. So they ended up being a co-investor. Um, and then the third one is uh, Daystar Power, who again we provided strategic advice to and we invested in 20, 2018 as well. And in 2022, we exited um, alongside other investors to shell corporate. So it is not that venture building was the main, main reason, but I think we played our role in a helping the companies attract financing across the various stages of the continuum. Thank you. Thank you, Irina. Thank um, you. I think it helps to add color to you know, the end game of what you do, and that's really, um, that's really insightful. Thank you for sharing. Um, I think so just turning to Tokunbo on, um, I think, two things. One is uh, any, any success stories you'd like to share, number one, and then segueing into what you call Gender Lens Investing 3.0, if you yes. could. Mm -hmm. Tell us more about that and what that is. Yeah. Yes. Um, so, yeah, where do I start? I mean, one of the first um, anchors of success that um, we have been involved in was back in 2011 when we backed the first uh, fintech um, in um, Nigeria. And um, before there was a license to even invest in such opportunities and uh, by virtue of being there at that time, we helped to write the mobile money license, which eventually has paved the way for all the fintechs that we see that coming out of uh, Nigeria and has paved an example for other central banks um, in terms of how they've written out their policy. That company has gone on to create hundreds of thousands of jobs and um, is across, uh, across Nigeria has um, over, over um, a thousand points of presence where um, people in peri-urban and rural areas are able to cash in, cash out. Even though we talk about the fintech generation and revolution, people still need cash in some of these uh, places. We still, we're, we're still scratching the surface um, some over 10 years uh, later. And so that has provided that network. Similarly, around that same time, we saw that with uh, microfinancial services, it was still quite rudimentary um, about 20 years ago. And so we invested in um, a microfinance unit um, entity that was literally a room in um, a market. And we helped to make it a national champion um, that it is today. Um, that company, we um, again helped to bring the national license, bring the governance, um, 
help grow it, uh, its um, book. In Naira, it, it's, it's in the billions of Nairas that has been decimated with currency, but nonetheless, we're, we're making a, um, an exit um, on that one. Um, and really, one of the key things for us has been an innovator. Even when we were working on the clean cooking, being intentional about what is the innovation that solves the problem. When we started talking about impact um, investing some 20 years ago, the term didn't even exist. And we had to think about what does that mean. But really, we start with the problem in mind and then think about who are the mission-driven entrepreneurs that we can back to solve that. And one of, one of those um, has resulted, again, with the Gender Fund and coming to um, a lady that we, we backed who had a small sort of premise factory somewhere up north, um, midway up north um, in Nigeria for cassava processing. We invested and we've helped to uh, create a whole community of smallholder farmers. We've helped move from expensive energy to bio-waste, innovative energy, where she has become now the, the largest producer and provider to multinationals for their input of starch and glucose in their manufacturing and is exporting uh, their product. But really the impact across those, that community and the children of the farmers has been significant. I can talk of many situations like that as well. Tomato processing in Kaduna, again, a whole community, small for transforming uh, that um, community. So perhaps I, I should stop there, but the overarching number across our funds is that we've been able to drive for um, tens of millions of jobs um, created. We've been able to enhance access to financial services to millions of homes and households and businesses through the different stages that we've um, invested in. So for us, financial success has been there, but really that impact, which, which has been at the DNA of Alithea when we started, is what's key um, for us as well. Uh, thanks so much for that. And uh, would you like to share with us uh some thoughts about gender lens investing. Oh yes, sorry, oh. Yes, sorry, sorry. I was trying not to hog the, uh, the limelight. So I mentioned earlier about um, the, the dividends of diversity, which is what we drive for with gender lens investing, which is you know, better corporate governance. I've talked about um, governance because you have the different perspectives, risk perspectives, and I won't go into talking about what the gendered risk perspectives are, but it's better to have more people of uh, different minds around the table to avoid group thinking. Um, and also um, innovation. If you're um, creating um, products and services for the whole economy of which women control about $15 trillion of purchasing power, you need to have diversity at the table for that um, innovation to be um, successful and better decision making. So, when we so that's what we try to seek for from gender lens investing. It's not that it's a moral obligation, it's that it's, it's, it, it builds for better inclusivity, better performance across um, the research, McKinsey, Harvard, companies that have gender diverse teams have 20% alpha in terms of performance, at least. And so that's the kind of alpha that we're trying to seek for in the diversity. And um, when Juri mentioned 2X, when we started our fund, it predates 2X. We were the first 2X, um, qualified fund. We had the framework that enabled 2X to build out on its first iteration of its framework. And now we're saying, well, yes, we need to drive for gender consciousness. We like the gender mainstreaming. But where we see in businesses, again, is that intentionality that is lacking around investing for energy efficiency and digital transformation. So what we're calling Gender 3.0 in our new fund is the Amplify Fund, is really about lay layering on top of gender um, consciousness and intentionality, this energy efficient intentionality, climate action and adaptation, and digital transformation. Because we find that, again, 
we don't just back female founders, but we find overwhelmingly with our female founders, it's in this digital transformation and um, energy efficiency that they have shied away. And so we're looking for that across the manufacturing facilities that we've helped set up. How do we green those? How do we reduce the cost? How do we improve lives and livelihoods for the communities around those facilities, the small um, holder farmers, and have that even greater um, impact? So, stop there. Great. Uh, thanks. Just turning now to Chinua. I think the first uh, guarantee that uh, InfraCredit issued was in December 2017. Yes. It's been. Uh, I'm trying to do the maths quickly. <laughs> seven <laughs> years. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> seven years. And so maybe share with us some of your learnings, impact of your work, and the importance of that de-risking role um, in, in, in supporting capital market uh, growth. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so yes, in 2017, I mean, um, when we first issued this guarantee for an um, off-grid um, energy service company uh, to raise a 10-year you know, bond from the capital market, um, prior to that, the tenor of financing was five years below and mostly from, from banks. And so it was essentially a first of its kind where, um, you know, a, a private company was able to raise this kind of financing from pension funds, directly invest in about 16 pension funds, participated in that instrument. And, um, you know, it set a pace because this is where you see the dem impact of demonstration effect. Because when others see what is possible, then it begins to impact on how others see what they can do. And we found, you know, beyond the fact that we supported other companies that later on were able to raise financing without a guarantee, because the institutional investors became comfortable after they had, you know, seen the performance of the asset. Because essentially our role is to come in to address, you know, that gap between perception of risk and actual risk. Right, because many a time it's really about lack of you know, knowledge and information, uh, which over time, once the guarantee acts as an enhancement to build market confidence, and they actually see the performance of the business, then they're comfortable to invest without the need for a guarantee in the future. So when we see our role as it evolves, it's really sort of like to walk yourself out of a job in the sense that you go to markets where you're needed, um, you help to address you know, that asymmetry of information uh, such that investors get more comfortable to play in those markets, and then you begin to shift your capacity to where there is asymmetry, and then you bridge that gap with your guarantee. And so the technical assistance you know, plays a very important role. Um, and how we begin to look at you know, um, the market as we evolve is really looking at the spectrum, so the continuum. Because the reality is that, you know, the, the, this, the gap, information gap is between, you know, the, the early stage provider of capital and what does exit look like? Is it through debt? Is it through capital markets? And who are you exiting to? And if we see ourselves as providers of long term and even some form of exit, then how do we work in symmetry or in symbiosis? Um, with the ecosystem better, such that we continue to provide more information about what we would like to see. So you, you kind of see how early stage, you know, um, you know, early stage support is using data and information that is more predictive about what lenders would like to see or what capital markets would want to see. And so we're kind of seeing this conversation around, you know, how to to create a, um, you know, a a relationship or a vehicle that actually supports that interaction, some form of enhancement towards providing some form of inception, early stage support. And that is really more driven by information because mm -hmm. you find that it's not about capital alone. It's about the quality of capital or how intelligent it is. So what does he understand in terms of what you require, whether it's the way you design and prepare your projects and the kind of financial models you use, the business plan you're writing, and you know, what you integrate into that um, business plan in terms of you know, sustainability requirements that lenders would like to see. We found that that is so important and being able to work in a system where you can share that knowledge could really significantly de-risk the market and create a, a continuum, as we speak, of um, that actually really works. So, one of the things I would like to to take forward from this, um, the, you know, this session is really work better with, um, you know, with, with within the system. Uh, we just talked about that. That look, if we look at the verticals within which we're particularly interested in, then how do we ensure that 
what exit looks like to you um, is, is what business looks like to us. And so we're able to, to share that knowledge more increasingly. Um, so those are some of the lessons learned as we look to inclusive growth, because there are two paradoxes that I feel affect um, in, in Africa. They talk about the lack of quality preparation. So even though you have a lot of money, you're not getting a lot of deals through. But also it's about what is inclusive infra or what is inclusive access. What does it mean? Because you don't, you know, we have to be a bit more broader in terms of how we look at what infrastructure means for a developing market and how we also, you know, support those um, those those pools of economies to also grow. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think it's a really important point made there around about the continuum and how one how, how, I mean, solutions at one end of the continuum or in the middle or at the end, I mean, they all complement each other. I mean, and that's, that's a really important point. I think finally to you, Olamipo, um, I think, uh, I mean, just to share with us from the investments you've made, you know, working across the continent in the larger, I mean, at the further end of the spectrum, um, you also have a market kind of development uh, objective. So how do you see that panning out in terms of the impacts of some of the work that you've done? Um, across the frontier that we are talking about today. Okay, thanks. Um, so for the Africa Local Currency Bond Fund, um, we are probably one of the largest um, deployer of local currency across the continent. Uh, so to date, since um, inception, we've deployed over $330 million in local currency. Um, and today we are invested in about 18 different um, African countries. And to be able to do that, um, you know, we've sort of strengthened our hedging capabilities and work well with um, some of the local players. But we also all know the importance of local currency funding for a number of these institutions. So a number of companies that we have supported prior to um, us coming in were primarily funded by um, foreign currency from DFIs, um, and you know we know the risk that that poses to to the financial performance given the pressure on local currencies um, across the continent. Um, I think we're quite proud of the fact that we've supported many first-time issuers. We've also supported many first-type transactions in various markets. And as Chinua said, what that does is it creates a roadmap which could be replicated firstly across many issuers in the same market, but even you know, across different countries on the continent. Um, so for example, in Nigeria, we supported um, the first microfinance institution, LAPO, to issue a bond on the capital market. Um, we anchored that transaction, and following that transaction, we've had a number of microfinance banks actually approach us to say, you know, they're looking to issue a bond. Um, in Senegal, in 2016, uh, we supported Baobab, which was the first microfinance entity also in, in the Yomura region to issue a bond, but it was also the first subsidiary within the Baobab group, group to issue a bond. Um, you know, a few years later, you've seen a number of subsidiaries within that group also come to market um, to, to raise local currency funding. Um, more recently, we uh, worked with uh, Tanga Wasa um, alongside FSD Africa, which was the first regional water utility in Tanzania to issue a bond. Um, away from just acting as anchor investors, we worked very well with them to improve the overall transaction structure for the benefit of local institutional investors, um, but also we're very actively involved in enhancing the ENS processes of the entity. So um, we hired an advisor to put together an ENS action plan um, to just improve you know, how the company was currently doing things. Again, you've seen a number of the regional water utilities in Tanzania start to explore the potential of issuing a bond because now they know that that's a viable route to raising local currency funding. Um, you know, I've talked about some of the other work that we've done um, in the market with you know, green bonds, first time issuers, um, and just more generally a technical assistance fund, which um, sort of helps think about complex transaction structures, securitizations, um, is something that we're doing quite a bit of in the Yomoa region. Um, and for us, again, we're bringing those structures um, to the market in a way where it's seen to be market international um, standards. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, and still staying on those large, um, 
larger institutions. I think, uh, I said earlier, I, was, I used to be a regulator, and one of the things we were trained to do is to follow the money. So we want to follow when they provide that support, where does it actually go, and we want to play a short clip. Um, and this is uh, listening to beneficiaries of our proceeds of a bond, a gender bond that was issued in uh, Nigeria um, that uh, we supported. So I'll just request if it can be, I think it's on cue. Jinalangu naitwa Naima Abdonor Rahmani. Naima anafanya biashara ambayo inaitwa mkajungu na dili na vifaa vya ujenzi na supply serikalini kwenye makampuni na watu binafsi. Nikiwa ndani ya mji wa Dar es Salaam huaga na enjoy kufanya biashara kwa sababu kwanza mkoa wa Dar es Salaam ni mkubwa na bado kuna sehemu zinaendelea kwa hiyo kusupply vifaa vya ujenzi bado vinahitajika kwa Dar es Salaam. Okay, na mpa niingie benki hapa nitoela kidogo kwa ajili ya uendeshaji wa dukani pale kuna gari linatakiwa lisafiri. Nilianza nikiwa mdogo sana na msingi wangu ulikuwa mdogo sana. Lakini nilienda nikikua taratibu taratibu kwa kupata mikopo sehemu mbalimbali. Nikaopti kwenda NMB, ndo nikaambiwa kuna mkopo umeanzishwa unaitwa Jasiri kwa interest ya 14%. Before nilikuwa nachukua interest ya almost 19% kwa plus na loan processes na kuwa inaweza kafika mpaka 25. Na koko inafurahia kwa sababu kuchukua mkopo wa milioni 300 kwa interest ya milioni 30 pa miezi 18 kwangu mimi ni nafu mno. Wewe hapa ndo dukani kwangu wangu. Now, Jasiri Bond was birthed out of our Jasiri Women's Market Proposition, which was launched back in 2020. And when we say women-owned businesses, we mean 50% or more of the ownership is a woman. And then we say also uh, businesses whose products and services supports a woman. A gender bond, like uh, Jasiri Gender Bond, aligns with the work that we do at the capital markets uh, pillar in FST Africa. And I think that's really what is important. It is how does this capital actually make a difference on the ground. We have financed close to 200 SMEs, over 3,000 MSMEs. But in addition to that, we've created over 3,000 loans. Majority of them, 77%, were MSMEs. Only about, I would say, 30, 23% were SMEs. Komajina, naitwa Gudila Kimati. We won't eat all the time uh, looking at that, but that's just, uh, I mean, there are, there are various beneficiaries that we spoke to on the ground. It's, it's, I think it's, I, I know that we understand in this room that capital is not raised for capital's sake. It actually achieves certain objectives, and it's always fulfilling to listen to the end beneficiary and what that difference made. And so for many of the ladies that we spoke to, um, they were able to expand their businesses, they were able to do much more, and uh, I mean, that uh, um, increases their, I mean, enhances their livelihoods and there are very many uh, impact objectives uh, that come out of that. But I think just in closing uh, this particular session, and I think we maybe have maybe two minutes for question and answer, but basically, I think what I'm hearing from the session today, there's a lot of uh, mention around innovation, intentionality, uh, creating solutions with an understanding of the problem. And I think that's very important for the African context. And that's, uh, I, I think, something that uh, the leading voices here have really highlighted. Um, identifying mission-driven entrepreneurs, uh, being gender conscious, uh, the power of demonstration, I think that's really well demonstrated and we, we see that as well in our, in our own work. Um, so really, I think many takeaways here. Uh, but I think for me, the biggest one is really about the fact that um, whatever is happening at one end of the spectrum is very important. It's not in, I mean, it should not be seen in isolation uh, when you're thinking about financing these underfunded sectors. I mean, it's a very complementary journey. Uh, what works for SMEs is important for the uh, small and growing businesses, and it's important to think about it that way, uh, uh, very intentionally. So thank you very much. I think I just want to request that we give a hand of applause to our panelists. And I should say, um, 
I'm, I'm not even sure we have time for q and I think it was a really robust discussion, but I just want to say, you know, today, I don't know if it was today morning when I was trying to look um, at the definition of a majority female panel, which is rare to see. Mm -hmm. You can't even find that on Google. You can find Manel because that's very common and it happens often. <laughs> so, and I'm pleased to say that I think there's no odd email saying we're looking for a female speaker. They're all here by their own right. So a round of applause to everyone on this panel, including Chinua. Yeah.